Monitor response times are a complete mess right now. I mean, every manufacturer is claiming that every single monitor is a, a one millisecond monitor. Reviewers like us are all using entirely different methodologies, meaning that you can't compare results between us, at least directly anyway. And actually, most reviewers aren't even testing for response times at all. That means that when you're searching for your next multi-hundred pound or dollar monitor, you're less equipped to make the best decision possible, and you can end up with a product that you spent a significant chunk of change on that you aren't all that happy with. I'm hoping, at least in theory, that this can help change that. This is my open source response time tool, or OSRTT for short. As I mentioned in the last video on this, that I'll link in the cards above if you haven't watched that already, I've spent the last six, actually going on seven months now, building this thing so that other reviewers and enthusiasts can use it to actually test with some level of consistency, accuracy, and detail. It's open source, both the hardware, firmware, and software, so if you want to build one yourself, modify the test or processing, or just see exactly what it's doing, you can. I'm gonna be making these sorts of pre-built kits available. I've already had a number of pre-orders, but if you want one, use the link in the description below to send me an email, or hit me up on Twitter, and I'll add you to the, uh, the ever-growing list of uh, boards of these that I need to build uh, by hand. This video though is all about explaining the, the challenges that I faced in, in building this thing and explaining what I did to, to solve those problems, both in hardware and in software. To understand the solutions though, you need to first understand the problem. So what is monitor response time and how do you measure it? How do you test for it? Well, in short, the response time is how long it takes the pixel or a monitor or a panel to change color. This is often measured as gray to gray because the test basically involves swapping different shades of gray, no, not 50, sadly, uh, on screen and using a photo sensor to effectively watch and record the light level changing as the colors get brighter or darker. An example graph looks something like this. It starts off low because the screen is on, well in this case, black, RGB zero, or I suppose as black as an LCD can get anyway. Then it steeply climbs until it reaches the end color, which in this case is full white or RGB 255. So what this little box is, is basically that photo sensor that I mentioned, at least sort of. At its core, it's the same basic design that Ashen from Aperture Grill detailed in his excellent video that I highly recommend you go and check out. I'll leave it in the cards and in the description for you. But the actual sensor itself is a Malexus MLX75305. That's a light to voltage sensor which takes power in, then varies the, what voltage it outputs based on how much light is hitting the, the actual tiny little sensor itself. It's a great fit for this, this task as it's pretty decently fast at responding to the changes in the light level between 10 and 22 microseconds. It's also impressively linear, meaning that the more light you shine in, the higher the outputs, and the, the sort of graph of that change is a nice straight line. And finally, it's also pretty sensitive. No, not about its size, it knows it's how you use it that counts. Uh, no, I mean that uh, it can detect incredibly small changes in light level. Now, it's no photo detector, those are incredibly expensive, uh, but also incredibly both, well, accurate and incredibly fast with often nanosecond rise times, but this one is uh, certainly good enough for this type of measurement. Turning that analog voltage into a digital signal is the job of the microcontroller. The SAMD51, a 32-bit ARM Cortex chip with two one mega sample per second uh, ADCs that offer a 12-bit resolution. That's on board this Adafruit Itsy Bitsy M4 Express, and it's an incredibly just cool and interesting bit of kit. 
It's also basically the same as what Ashen is using, just a, a smaller version. Now, I am actually using both of those analog to digital converters here. One, of course, for the sensor input, or the sensor signal, but also one for measuring the 5 volt USB power, or power rail, both for noise and level. That's done through a simple potential divider to drop the 5 volts from the USB port down to around 2.5 volts, which is nicely under the 3.3 volt maximum that this chip can handle. That lets me account for the USB voltage and flag if it's too low, as well as also check how noisy the power that's going to the sensor is going to be. Now, I said that this chip's maximum input voltage is 3.3 volts, but this is a 5 volt sensor, so how does that work? Well, it's basically the, the same as the USB output, it goes through a potential divider. Although in this case, it's actually a potentiometer, actually a digital potentiometer, no less. That lets me account for a lot of different stuff, including the USB voltage differences and the monitor's brightness level not being absolutely spot on. Now, just to make sure that I don't accidentally damage the microcontroller, I've also added a voltage limiter. I tried a whole load of different solutions for this, but none worked how I wanted, or there were far too many components, because I just wanted to keep this nice and simple. So here's my solution, and I'm incredibly pleased with how it came out. Basically, it's uh, effectively a, what's called an active clamp, but with a potentiometer feeding the gate of the PNP transistor 2.89 volts. Why 2.89 volts? Well, I found that the default setting, that the standard uh, sort of design for an active clamp circuit, which would be 3.3 volts, the, the full 3.3 volts to the gates, that doesn't end up starting to, to clamp the voltage until about 3.6 volts, and at its peak will go up to like 4.5 but if you provide the gate 2.89 volts, then that starts clamping at almost exactly 3.3 volts, and it has a peak voltage of around 3.6, 3.7, which is certainly something that I would call a win and certainly safe for the controller to handle, especially for a brief, you know, instance of time. Noise is also a problem, both from the USB 5 volt rail and from the, the sensor and the monitor themselves. Both though can be helped with capacitors. Specifically the sensor's datasheet recommends a 1 microfarad and a 1 nanofarad capacitor be connected across the power and ground pins and recommends some form of smoothing capacitor for the, the sensor's output, which I've gone with the absolutely tiny uh, 10 picofarad and 4.7 picofarad ceramic capacitors. They help smooth the output without affecting the timing. Anything larger, and it starts to effectively slow the transition or slow the capture of the transition. I've also uh, added a 10 millihenry inductor for filtering high frequency noise from the 5 volt rail, and that's fed from the USB pin on the Bitsy Bitsy M4, not the V high pin, as that one has, I think, a, a switching regulator which basically just introduces noise just all on its own. Finally, on the hardware side, there is the case. This is something that I designed in Fusion 360 and prints on my resin 3D printer, which actually makes it come out pretty nice. Uh, the button uh, that I, I added is actually on a separate PCB that's vertical so that when you're pressing on it, you're not pressing down onto the display, which can be certainly a bit awkward in a more sort of ergonomic position. Um, the case itself is something that uh, in theory you can dismantle. There's no glue. I designed it all to just sort of slide together. Although I should make it clear that a lot of the, the rails and uh, little tabs that sort of hold it all together can be pretty brittle and are relatively thin. And so if you do try and dismantle this, uh, I should make it clear that I'm, I'm not going to be liable for any, uh, any damage or uh, mistakes that you have happen. Uh, I can, however, uh, print replacement parts and make them uh, available for sale if you need them, but um, I thought I'd make that one clear. Uh, everything that I designed with this is uh, sort of well uh, reinforced. Things like the button and the, the PCB that the button is on is well reinforced inside, so that won't you know, fatigue and break over time. 
like I said, uh, you can sort of dismantle it and replace any components, update anything, tweak anything you like. Uh, I've also added a uh, sort of a pointer on the lid so that you know where the sensor is on the bottom. This isn't too uh, important right now, but when I get to adding the input lag testing that this is perfectly suited to do, uh, this uh, that, that sort of marker will be nice and useful. Okay, so that's the, the hardware, but what about the software? Well, honestly, that's been quite possibly the most complicated bids. Uh, I've tried to account for as many edge cases, irregularities, and even potential user errors as possible, but it's important to make it clear that this whole thing isn't perfect. I will have missed some issues and I'm basically doing an entire company's worth of design, development, testing and manufacturing in my spare time while producing three tech videos a week, a car video a week and managing locally while also being uh, perceived severely both mentally and physically disabled. So if you do find a bug, please do report it, ideally on GitHub, but please also understand that I can't guarantee that I can get it fixed instantly. It might take days, weeks, or months, depending on how much of a challenge it is to get sorted. And you know, if I can like walk or eat or just function that week. With that said, my main aim with this project has kind of been transparency. I want you to not only trust the, the sort of me and my work, but actively trust the results that you're getting. That's why all of the processing is done in the desktop program and the raw data from the board is saved to file after every run. That means that you can just import the raw data again at any point to reprocess the results, either with different settings, just regenerate the final files if you lost or sort of corrupted them, or after an update. For example, if I were to include a new metric like the cumulative deviation stat that Tim from Hardware Unboxed uses, you can you know, just re-import your old files and you don't have to have the, the monitor and actually actively run the test again. All of the data is there for you to then sort of uh, reprocess and manipulate how you like. It also means that you can effectively stick all of that raw data in the, the graph view template I made and manually check over what it is that the monitor is actually doing, which should help you catch things like the recent Samsung Odyssey G9 variable refresh rate issues. Now, I know that many people who will end up using this won't have tested response times before, so I've set this up with a, a default list of settings that I think are the right mix of easy to understand, technically accurate, and will help push the industry forward, as well as make it easier for the average buyer to actually know what it is they're buying. I'm planning on a full video explaining that whole side of the topic because that's a, an entire world on its own, but in short, I've currently anyway, settled on what I'm calling the perceived response time, as in the response time factoring in any overshoots, but removing the, the to uh, remo removing a little tolerance, specifically RGB5, so that uh, you're not capturing any of the, the completely imperceptible and heinously slow trails often towards the end of a transition. Then, uh, also the overshoot amount, specifically how many RGB values higher that it ends up going than the target end level. And finally, also what I'm calling the visual response rating, which effectively describes the relationship between how quickly the panel can get to the correct color and change away from the, the original, the starting color, and how long it takes to actually settle at that color. Specifically, for example, if it's a, a slow VA panel that doesn't overshoot, but just takes its sweet time, versus uh, an IPS panel with pretty strong overshoots, but is much faster to, to get away from that previous color, albeit missing the target and 
kind of taking some time to, to come back down again. Of course, if you would rather report different metrics, like the more traditional initial response time, as I'd like to perhaps rename it, or even uh, use different sort of tolerances, things like the, the again, traditional 10 to 90% based on the light level, or uh, say Tim's 3 to 97% setup based on the RGB values, or even change the overshoot reported as a, a percentage, or even just based on the light level instead of RGB value. All of those settings and a few more are all available under the advanced setting options and are there for you to use if you fancy. Either way, that data gets spit out into an Excel file with the heat maps pre-generated for you. It even captures what refresh rate the monitor was set to and presets that in the, the file for you. All you need to do is uh, note down which overdrive mode you are using. But the thing is that this process isn't perfect. The monitor can have some off results. The processing might mess up one transition, so it, it isn't perfect, which is why I added the multiple run averaging. By default, it's set to run the test five times, and uh, you can set it up to currently 10 times uh, if you want the, the added accuracy, although I've changed some things around so you, I might be able to uh, increase that uh, even higher if you wanted. Uh, the program will actually even do outlier rejection before averaging to discard any erroneous results on a result by result basis, meaning that it won't just throw out an entire run just because one value seems to be out of whack, it just won't include that one before it starts averaging. If you do choose to use the, the gamma correction mode, or you pick the, the save gamma table option, you'll be greeted with the, the, the fruits of the dedicated gamma test, which I am still currently tweaking, so uh, there's a bit of asterisk there, but <clears throat> basically it captures around 50 milliseconds of each flat RGB value, then uses cubic interpolation to generate every in-between RGB value from 0 to 255, following a, a nice curve. It's a natural spline using the excellent Scott plot library, well, actually a, a couple of files borrowed from it, but I think I'll be making use of the, the full library uh, for the, the live view that I want to add in, at least at some point. Now, one thing that I have added in, but that isn't quite what I wanted, but will do for now, is the system uptime checker. That checks how long your system has been running. But why, you ask? Well, in general, a liquid crystal, much like your car's engine, takes some time to heat up and doesn't perform all that well when it's cold. Everything is stiffer and, in LCD's case, slower. You really need to let the monitor warm up for 20 to 30 minutes before doing any testing. The uptime checker, well, checks if your system has been on and running for more than 30 minutes. And if not, it gives you a, a little warning to, to let you know that ideally you should let it warm up first. Now, ideally, I would be having this look for when the monitor that you've selected to test was, was initialized, because, uh, you know, if your system is still running and you just plug in another display rather than restarting, that could uh, there could be some outliers there, but I couldn't figure out how to find that information from C Sharp, so I think that's a battle for another day. When it comes to actually, well, collecting the data, the first thing that you need to do is work out when the transition starts and ends. It's pretty easy for a human to, to look at this and go, uh, there and there, yeah, done. But for a computer, it's not quite that simple or, or obvious. I ended up taking a couple hundred samples at the start and end and building a minimum or maximum. Then loop through the values looking for where the data spikes out of those bounds. I've got some additional checks to make sure that it won't return a, a false positive and pick a result too early. And if it fails those checks, it will update the, the minimum or maximum if it needs to. I do that from the start of the test, or start of the, the list, and from the end, which gives me a pretty accurate, complete response time figure. To get the, the trimmed measurements, I basically do the same thing, but look for where it crosses the, the threshold rather than the, the min or max. 
when it comes to overshoots, that's just taking the, the min or max value within the complete response time measurement and comparing that to the, the end average. And if it's overshoot or undershoot, then you can calculate that value either by the RGB value or by the light level itself. Now, some monitors have backlight strobing or, or dithering that's permanently on. This isn't quite the same as black frame insertion or ultra low motion blur, ULMB, but it is a massive pain to try and get a usable measurement out of this madness, which is why I'm using a filter to smooth out the noise, but importantly, without affecting the actual response time curve. At the time of writing and filming this, I'm using a standard moving average function with a variable window size ranging from 10 by default to 50 for really bad noise. I say at the time of writing because I'm planning on testing out a Savitsky Goulet filter uh, very soon which might be even more accurate and so I may end up using that but since I haven't implemented it or tested it yet, I can't say for sure. Either way, I do some form of sort of filtering and smoothing to make sure that the results are actually accurate, especially when it's the computer that's processing them. Finally, we have the problem of keeping things up to date. I'm using autoupdater.net to be able to automatically push updates so that once you have the, the program installed, it will prompt you automatically with a new uh, when a new version is available and then be able to automatically download, unpack and install that version with just a single click. I've also bundled the firmware updates with that too and the program itself using the Arduino CLI uh, that I bundled in the installer can update the board on its own again just with a single click. Okay so that's what I've got done but what's left to do? Why haven't I, I shipped these to the, the people who have pre-ordered them already? Well, there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, I've only just got the adaptive smoothing working, which was a, a pretty big challenge to test and calibrate the, the sort of settings and confirm that it wasn't actually affecting the results. And I'm still tweaking things like the, the detection point code to, to fix some outlier results. I'm also fixing bugs so that it's as easy and smooth and uh, sort of to use as possible and as accurate as possible as well. And I'm also technically speaking changing how the, the board and program uh, run the test. Previously I had the board uh, both sending the key presses and running the, the full loop itself but that can be a bit of a, a pain and so I'm switching it so that it's the desktop program that tells the board what you know key to press next and then run that single result and so that's introduced uh, plenty more bugs that I'm also fixing too. I've also been working with Simon from TFT Central who has been testing this against his equipment and has helped with uh, getting the results actually accurate and finding a bunch of bugs, some of which I'm still working on. And if I'm being honest, uh, things have been pretty, uh, I would say tough uh, or rough, I don't know, uh, for the last sort of month or so. Um, mental and physical health challenges uh, have made things pretty difficult uh, and this has kind of had to take a, a bit of a back seat uh, as I sort of struggle through my um, my, my main work and uh, you know sort of making these videos and honestly just kind of surviving at times so uh, my apologies for the delay but um, with that said I am hoping or I'm feeling pretty confident that this is actually close to, to being ready uh, and I think that I'll be starting to build some units sometime ideally late next week in theory uh, and in theory both things being well I may be able to have units in hand at very kind of at worst by the end of January but I'm ideally hoping for much sooner than that. For those that are already on my, my list, I'll get in touch as soon as I have a unit ready and available to, to ship to you. And for those who want one but haven't reached out yet, please do and I will add you to the list. So yeah, that's the response time tool. Uh, there's still a lot that I haven't kind of covered, explained or you know, all that sort of stuff. And so if you have any questions or especially any suggestions, feel free to leave those in the comments down below. 
there's a lot that I'm still working on, still tweaking, and so uh, and inevitably there'll be a lot of stuff that I'm still working and tweaking with uh, for you know forever after, really. Um, but the main thing for me that I want to to make it clear is one, um, I am uh, a human and a bit of an idiot, so uh, th don't take this as absolute gospel. And two, um, this is something that I am. Uh, building, you know, sort of primarily for myself. Uh, I suppose much like locally, uh, it's something that I wanted, I felt I, I needed, and so um, I'm the sort of person, as you can tell, that just kind of um, goes and makes the thing that I need if it doesn't exist or isn't, um, you know, what I want. So uh, here we have a thing. Um, if you want to support me making this thing, then you can, uh, you know, obviously hit the subscribe button as always. If you want to support sort of more directly, you can of course uh, purchase one of the, the pre-built kits, uh, or you can just, you know, kind of donate directly. You can uh, support through the YouTube join button, where you also get some cool rewards like access to our Money Mid Discord chat, sponsor free videos, and some cool uh, emojis to use in the, the comments and on our weekly live streams. Uh, there's also Patreon if you'd rather uh, support there instead, and you still get access to our Money Mid Discord chats. And uh, yeah, there's uh, plenty of other sort of links in the description. There's uh, sort of, I guess, less direct ways like affiliate links are places like Amazon or Overclock UK if you're buying from there. There's also, of course, things like merch for hoodies or t-shirts like this one or a load of other stuff that I designed myself as well. And uh, yeah, that's kind of it really. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video, found it useful, interesting, informative or entertaining, I don't know. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll catch you all in the next video. Have a fantastic Christmas and I will see you uh, probably sometime in uh, either late next week or start of uh, the, you know, kind of the new year. So yeah, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you in the next video.